today's seminar, we're going to talk about long-range deep water fishing, deep water bottom fishing primarily, snapper, grouper, tilefish, barrel fish, and a wide variety of snappers and groupers, and some pelagic species as well, blackfin tuna, wahoo. A lot of this is going to take place locally, and a lot of it's going to take place in other areas around the state. Okay? Let's start with preparation. When we're talking about long-range fishing, we're not talking about fishing right out front here on the reef, are we? We're talking about 300 to 1,000 feet of water. To reach that area sometimes is a really long-distance trip. You know, we know we're fortunate right off our coast here. We can get into deep water relatively quick. Just a few miles off the beach, boom, it plummets and we're in deep water. But we also know that we do not have fantastic deep water fishing right out front here. Correct? Well, if you're not sure about that, we don't, okay? <laughs> Certainly, you can catch some decent fish right out front here, but not like some other areas, okay? We know the Bahamas. Who fishes the Bahamas? Okay, great bottom fishing in the Bahamas, only one, two people. You guys are missing the boat. The Bahamas is right here, 50, 60, 70 miles, and you're a world away. You really are. The Gulf of Mexico, I have to stress, absolutely an awesome, awesome venue for deep water bottom fishing. Far superior than the Atlantic coast. Far superior, okay? Different world altogether. We've got great sail fishing. We have great dolphin fishing. We have fantastic sword fishing. We've got a lot of great fisheries right out front here. But when it comes to deep water bottom fishing, it's all about the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, it really, really is. So preparation, let's get back in touch with that. You've got a couple different options for long range fishing. One option, is to do it yourself on your own boat, and one option is on a head boat. And this all boils back down to preparation. You've got to be really, really prepared in either scenario because a lot of this fishing is long range. You're out there sometimes two, three, four days. There's even a boat called the Gulf Star that sails out of Tarpon Springs. Anybody ever sail on the Gulf Star? It's a head boat. They even do a seven-day long range bottom trip. Seven days. Imagine being on a boat with you guys for seven days. Mostly it's two or three days. You know, that's really the key. Two or three days when you're talking about head boats, when you're on your own boat. It's really not one day because even if you run over to the Bahamas, you've got to check in in the morning, then you go fishing, you've got to stay overnight. It's going to be a couple of days. So preparation, really important. If you're going on your own boat, fuel, I can't stress that enough. Make sure you've got plenty of fuel. When you think you have enough, you don't. You never know what could happen out there. And I know this is obvious, but if you're going to travel 100 miles, you need more fuel than just a 200-mile round trip. Am I right? Okay. So make sure you've got plenty of fuel, plenty of safety gear. The small things make a big difference. You know, there's no fish that's worth your life. We've heard all of these stories of different scenarios and different tragedies that have happened that could have been avoided. People could have been saved. You know, the number one reason that people get lost at sea, number one, no life jacket, no EPIRB or communication devices, personal beacons. I can tell you if I'm going to travel way over the horizon, I'm going to have everything. I don't care what boat I'm in. Even when I go on a head boat, I bring a ditch bag, okay? And it's got signaling devices and an EPIRB and a personal locator beacon. I don't trust anybody with my life and, you know, I don't know if you should. So safety, your number one priority in any scenario. There are a lot of charter boats up and down the coast you know, the East Coast, down around the Keys, even in the Gulf Coast, there's charter boats all over Florida that would be more than happy to take a group of anglers out for whatever amount of time. But most of the time on the head boats, it's usually one guy or two or a small group of two or three. It's difficult to charter a boat for $5,000 or even more with just a couple of guys. So what you're looking for is an open boat type of scenario, a boat that will allow you to book a trip you know, on a one-ticket basis by yourself or with a friend or a small group. There's only a few boats in Florida that you can do that with in the entire state of Florida. One of them sails out of Key West. It's called the Yankee Captains. One of them sails out of Tarpon Springs. It's called the Gulf Star that we just talked about. And then, of course, we have the Hubbard's fleet, okay? So those are really only your three options. Personally, I'm a huge fan of the Yankee Captains. This guy can fish. He's about catching fish. And if I'm going to go on a long-range trip, I want to go with somebody who can put me on the meat. That's what it's about. When it comes to head boats, there's limited options. I highly recommend the Yankee Captains, and I also highly recommend the Gulf Star. 
Those two guys are the best in the business around the state. On these long-range bottom fishing trips, I like to say this. Even when it's bad, it's good. And when it's good, it's fantastic. So wintertime, you're not going to see a lot of long-range offshore deep water bottom fishing. It's mostly going to be from spring through fall. Okay? Not because that's the best time of the year for the bite, because that's not true. The bite's probably phenomenal in the middle of the winter. The fish are there. It's because the conditions allow you to get out there and fish for these species during that time of the year, from the spring through the fall. Okay, the, the sea conditions are nice, it's pleasant, sometimes extremely hot, obviously, but that spring through fall time period really is the predominant time when we're long range bottom fishing deep water. Let's take a quick look at a chart here. Everybody see those contour lines where it goes to deep blue? That's where that real sharp drop off is, where the ocean just plummets into an abyss. And you can see how that deep line is much closer to the east coast here than it is on the west coast, am I right? Goes right up the east coast of Florida versus out in the Gulf Coast, it's way, way offshore. But we're faced with a huge problem here on the east coast. By show of hands, anybody have any idea what that problem is? Why we're really, really challenged when we go offshore here to deep water to do any bottom fishing in 800 feet of water? What's the biggest problem that we face? The Gulf Stream current. That Gulf Stream out here is running from three to five knots every day. Every day, 24 hours a day, no matter what. If the Gulf Stream stops running, we got big problems, people. Big, big problems. It's constantly running to the north. When you have five knots of current, makes it very challenging to hold the bottom, doesn't it? Okay, I'm telling you, it does. Makes it extremely challenging to get any sort of bait to the bottom. And when you're fishing for snappers and groupers and tilefish, species that relate to structure tight to the bottom, if you can't keep your bait in the strike zone, what are you going to catch? Gaga, nothing. Okay, you're not going to catch them. So that's really a big challenge that we face right here. We can overcome it sometimes if it's a little bit shallower, fishing more lead, lighter line. But again, there are other areas where we're faced with a lot less current, Gulf of Mexico. Structure, let's talk about that. These are bottom fish. Bottom fish relate to structure. Everybody knows that, right? They don't just swim out in the middle of the open water. It's a bottom fish. It feeds on mollusks and crustaceans and fin fish and shrimp and crabs and lobsters and, you know, juvenile fish, anything that it could eat. And all of that stuff relates to structure. When we're talking about deep water fishing, we're not talking about wreck fishing. We're not talking about fishing deep water sunken ships. What we're talking about is natural reef ledges, coral, you know, different breaks in the bottom, humps, ridges, hills, and even mud. One of the popular species that we target when we're deep water bottom fishing are tilefish. Is that a beautiful fish or what? Okay, that fish does not live on a ledge. Okay, that fish lives in the mud. What it does is it finds an area where it's really muddy and it builds a burrow, like a cave. And it literally will live in that cave. So someone also emailed me and asked me, if I want to go tile fishing, how do I find them on my sonar if they live in the mud? And my answer is, you don't, because they're in the mud. You're not going to see them. Okay, you're not. But you have to fish in the mud because you know that that's where they live. So you know that's their front yard. That's where you're going to fish. Okay? So sometimes the mud is what you're looking for if you're specifically looking for tile fish, or that's what the captain of the party boat that you're on, the head boat, is looking for. How does he know? Well, there's a lot of different ways. One of them is charts. You know, on all of these charts that they sell, it shows you the bottom composition right on the chart. It'll show you what that bottom is made out of. So you can cross-reference. If I know I want to target tile fish out here in 450 feet of water for gray tile fish, I'm going to look on the chart. I'm going to find areas where the bottom is muddy in the depth that I'm looking for, and that's where I'm going to start my search. Okay, is it going to pay off every time? No, but at least you're not going out there blindly. Got to do some homework. You've got to do some research if you're going out on your own. That's a big benefit to fishing on head boats because you don't have to do that research. You don't have to do that at all. All you have to do is go, have a good time, and catch fish, right? 
So there's some huge advantages to going on these headboat trips when it comes to multi-day long range bottom fishing. Another big advantage, you know, we talked about this, we touched a little bit on fuel, but remember, if you're fishing 110, 120, way out into the Gulf of Mexico, guess what's out there? Nothing. Zero. You don't see recreational boats. You don't see commercial boats. The only thing you see are the occasional freighter and the occasional cruise ship coming by and the Navy every now and then. That's it. There's nowhere to run and hide in the event some foul weather happens to pop up. So the logistics of fishing way offshore on your own boat become even more challenging, don't they? Especially if you have to go to a particular area, may it be the Gulf of Mexico now, of course you've got to get your own boat from here over to the Gulf, then travel way out there. You know, certainly doable, highly recommended if you have the right crew, but don't discount headboats. Anybody ever hear the Dry Tortugas? Anybody ever hear the Middle Grounds? Okay, those are great locations way out in the Gulf of Mexico. A lot of fish on those spots, but now the boats are going further. They're going further, they're breaking down the boundaries, they're exploring new territories, and they're saying, hey, these spots like the Dry Tortugas and the Middle Grounds, yeah, we've caught fish here, but not like out there. It's a whole different world out there. It's, it's really exciting. I mean, I gotta tell you, because every time you drop a bait to the bottom, Every time, when I'm out there, every single time I drop a bait to the bottom, you know what's on my mind? One thing, that right there. I'm thinking that that guy could be the next fish that eats my bait. You know, I'm ready and prepared for every single bite to be that fish. You may not be that prepared. You may be fishing two guys away from me and may not be as ready as I am. You may have a different mindset. Your tackle may be a little bit different. And this is what is so important, is that to be successful when every fish could be like that, it's all about the details, right? It's all about the details. Let's talk about tackle. When you're fishing deep water, 300 to 1,000 feet of water, this is no joke, people, okay? We're not talking about fishing for little yellowtails on a little 10-pound spinner. That's not the name of the game. You know, back in the day, not long ago, when guys went out to fish bottom fish in deep water, a lot of it was using electric rod and reels, right? Deep dropping. And everybody, you know, kind of back then, I'll go back five to 10 years even, was using these big reels, the big crystals, the LPs, all this big stuff that you fished out of a rod holder, really wasn't that sporty. People email me all the time or call me all the time, say, that's not sport, that's not fishing, you're a commercial fisherman. You've got a big electric reel, it's in a rod holder, you just push a button and boom, game over. What sport is there in that, okay? Personally, I disagree, first of all, because keep in mind, electric reels they're a tool, they serve a purpose, very much like an electric kite reel, very much like an electric downrigger. It serves a purpose, you don't use it all of the time, you use it when you have to use it. However, nowadays, tackle has evolved tremendously, and the way that we're fishing now is completely different than the way that we were fishing in the past. And all of this applies, if you're on your own boat, if you're on a charter boat, you're on a head boat, all of this applies. Got two different options. When you're out there fishing and you're fishing on the shallower end, and we'll call the shallower end 250 to 300 up on the bank, all the way to four to 500 feet before it really plummets. And kind of picture this in your head, you know, you know the ocean is not just a flat area. The surface is flat, but below that surface on the bottom, there are huge canyons and valleys and ridges and ledges. It's like the Grand Canyon, so to speak, submerged underwater. That's what it's like out there. So you have to kind of picture that in your head. When you're up on the bank, up on the plateau, up on top, that water is two to 400 feet deep, okay? You don't need an electric rod and reel to fish in 200 to 400 feet of water, am I right? You absolutely do not. As a matter of fact, we don't recommend it. They won't even let you use it. The only time you need the power assist equipment is on the deeper side. But up there on the bank, we're fishing with eight foot rods, okay, rated for 30 to 60 pound line, conventional reel loaded with 30 pound diamond braid. Not 50 pound, not 80 pound, not 100 pound, 30 pound. And you may say to yourself, boy, that sounds awfully light, 30 pound. This 30 pound diamond braid, or any braid for that matter, is super strong. Have you ever tried to break braid? You can't. Okay, you absolutely, I mean, you can't. The only time braid will break is if it's damaged because remember that braided fishing line is exactly that, it's braided. 
from a bunch of small fibers. If those fibers get damaged or cracked or, you know, a couple of them part, you won't even see it with the naked eye, but you've now created a weak spot in your line. And that line will fail. Premature tackle failure every time. Okay, that line will fail. But as long as that braid is in good condition and it's not damaged, it's not going to break. It's, you're just not going to put that much pressure. If you're putting that much pressure on a 30-pound braid, your rod will break. Okay, you're not fishing properly. You're not using your drag. The 30-pound braid is really important for deep water bottom fishing. Very important. I can't stress this enough for a number of reasons. Number one, it's super thin. Super, super thin. Okay? That means less resistance in the water column. The less resistance you have against your line in the water column, the lighter of a, of a weight that you could fish. Am I right? Does that all make sense to you? And the more sensitive that it is. And if I have a bait that's 800 feet away from me, I want to feel that fish fart on my bait. Okay? I want line and I want, a ta I want tackle that is that sensitive. I want to be able to know exactly what is happening with my rig, with my bait at all times. 30-pound braid allows me to do that. However, I cannot fish my 30-pound braid right to my rig. Why? Because braid has no elasticity. Okay? It does not stretch. If I had a 100-foot long piece of monofilament, I could stretch it a third of its length before it, before it breaks, before it parts. It's like a giant rubber band. Okay, literally, it's very elastic. Braid has no elasticity at all. Nothing stretches. So that means every little action, every little thing that I do with my rod tip is translated all the way down to my rig. But again, I said to you earlier, I said I can't fish my braid directly to my rig because of that number one factor. There's no elasticity. You have to have some give. You have to have a shock absorbing factor that has to be incorporated into your rig or you are going to pull hooks and you will rip the hook right out of the fish. May not happen on a three pound hand bone snapper, but hook a 35 pound yellow edge grouper and see what that thing is like. Okay, hook a 25 pound barrel fish that's fighting for its life all the way up from the bottom. See what that's like. You have to have some elasticity. So we connect a top shot on top of our braid. Doesn't have to be long, shouldn't be long, 20 to 25 feet. So if I'm fishing 30 pound braid, I've got 20 to 25 feet of 50 or 60 pound monofilament off the top of my braid. There are no swivels, I'm connecting it with a nice streamlined knot. I double up my braid with a bimini twist and I connect my top shot with an Albright knot. Listen. There's a lot of knots out there, some really fancy stuff. Really, really fancy stuff. Don't try and master that. Master the basic stuff. Make sure that you can tie those knots really, really well. A loop knot, you know, a, a bimini twist. Just pick a, you know, half a dozen good knots that you're going to use all of the time, but make sure they're right because I'm telling you, out there in deep water, 300 to 1,000 feet of water, when you connect with these big, powerful bottom fish, any flaw that you have in your system, that fish will exploit, and you will experience premature tackle failure. Okay, I've seen it so many times. Guys will hook a fish, within the first 10, 15 seconds, they lose that fish. Why? Because either their drag wasn't set properly, they were applying too much heat, one of their knots was weak. Make sure that each and every one of your connections are perfect. So we go from the braid, to the monofilament top shot that gives us that little bit of elasticity. So when I'm fighting that fish and that fish is pulling away, it's got that little bit of stretch, okay, that little bit of stretch. Otherwise, I'm going to pull hooks and rip that hook out of that fish's mouth every single time. Another thing that this 30-pound braid does is it gives me maximum line capacity. So I can fish a much smaller, lighter outfit with a lot more line capacity. If I had monofilament on this reel, if I had, let's just say, 30 pound monofilament, I might have 400 yards of line. 30 pound braid, how about 14, 12, 1400 yards of line? You know, in other words, an unlimited amount of line. So again, I can fish a much lighter outfit. Let's talk a little bit more about the rod. Two, three years ago, I said, you know, Marshall, I do a lot of long range deep water bottom fishing. I said, you know, I need a rod that's really comfortable, but yet strong. Strong enough to where if I hook a 50-pound black grouper, I don't want to be undergunned, okay? But 
At the same token, I don't want to fish with a broomstick all day long because I'm really going to get tired and fatigued. So I came in with a request. I said I need an eight-foot rod rated for 30 to 60-pound line that I can beat up a 50-pound black grouper with. And I want the entire rod to weigh under one pound. And he went, what? And long story short, 15.9 ounces. Okay, he did it. Composite blank, titanium guides. We cut short the, the foam a little bit. So it's super light. That's super important because you want to be comfortable. Am I right? You're fishing for a long time. You don't want to fish with a big broomstick. More importantly, you need the sensitivity in the tip. You need that little bit of sensitivity because believe it or not, even though you're fishing really deep water, it's all about knowing exactly what is going on 800 feet away from your rod tip. Think about 800 feet, an 80-story building. And I'm at the top of the building, and my rig is way on the bottom, and a mutton snapper like this is about to eat my bait. I want to know it. I want to feel it. I want to know exactly what that fish is doing. So you need the sensitivity so you can see that soft tip. Anything that's happening, I could feel it. Okay? Between the combination of the braid and that soft tip and the sensitivity of the rod blank, it puts an absolutely perfect weapon in my hand when I'm going after deep water bottom fish. Okay? The rig, let's talk a little bit about that when it comes to manual fishing. When you are fishing with a manual rod and reel in 300, or let me rephrase that, in 200 to 400 feet of water, because we're rarely fishing manual equipment in over four to 500 feet of water unless the conditions allow. If there's not a lot of current, this is the way to go. Okay, if there's a lot of current and we need a lot more lead, this isn't the way to go because you'll just kill yourself cranking all day long and you're not going to be able to fish enough lead to keep that rig in the strike zone. But when conditions do allow, we fish a single hook rig. When you are manually fishing with a rod under your arm for snappers and groupers, you are not fishing a chicken rig, a deep drop rig that has multiple hooks. You guys know what I'm talking about? Of course, three, four, five, six hooks sometimes way too heavy, too much going on there. I don't want to catch six fish at one time, okay? If they were one pound each, I'll catch 16 at one time, but they're not. These fish are like this, okay? That's what we're going after. That's why we spend $1,000. That's why we go out there for four days at a time. It's not to come home with small fish. It's to, for the opportunity to catch the biggest fish in any one of those classes. trophy size mutton snapper, giant golden tile fish, big gray tile fish. So you're not targeting these small little fish. So you don't want to catch two at a time because even if you did hook two giant fish on one rig, what could happen? They could literally bust themselves off, okay, from one pulling one way and one pulling the other way. So our single hook rig, let's talk a little bit about that. This is the top of my rig. I've got 16 ounces of lead, okay, 16 ounces of lead on a sliding swivel. Okay, so this swivel slides right up and down the line, right here, 16 ounces. Of course, this lead will vary depending on depth, depending on current. Okay, this lead will vary. But for the most part, I want to fish enough lead where I know that my bait is in the strike zone. Where's the strike zone? Right on the bottom. I don't want my bait 30 feet off the bottom. You think a mutton snapper is going to come 30 feet off the bottom to chase my bait? He's not going to do it. I mean, sometimes they will, but very rarely. And certainly groupers are not going to, and tile fish are not going to swim that high off the bottom. So I want to make sure that my rig is within 10 feet of the bottom. That's my goal. I want my rig within 10 feet, or I should say my bait within 10 feet of the bottom. 16 ounces, sliding sinker. Why do I have a sliding sinker? Because I want to avoid, number one, I want my rig to avoid getting tangled, because dropping a tangled rig down that has the helicopter motion, you guys know what I'm talking about? Your leader just goes woo, 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 and it's all around your main line and you're fishing down there and you're not getting a bite, this guy's slaying them and you can't get a bite because your rig's all tangled up and you don't even know it. You're like, you know, I have no idea what's going on, okay? So you have to avoid getting that rig tangled. So that sliding sinker helps do that. And you can also see I have a little bead in between these swivels, okay? That also helps avoid the helicopter effect. Otherwise, this swivel will sometimes get caught on the little knot right there. It's the little things that make a big difference. So I fish a little bead. My leader is long. Here's my sinker. 
And look where that hook is. It's 10 to 12 feet away. Okay, why? Because remember, listen to this. Wait. You hear that? Guess what happens if that mutton snapper right there hears that? He's gone. He's gone. He's going, whoa, that don't sound right. Whew, gone. Okay, just like that. I'm, I'm out of here. Okay. Yeah, he's gone. So I want a long leader. And it's also on that sliding system so when the fish picks up the bait and runs off with it, he doesn't feel the resistance of the lead. Does that make sense? So this is an absolutely killer rig, 50-pound fluorocarbon. You don't have to fish fluorocarbon. I fish diamond presentation. You certainly can fish monofilament. Fluorocarbon is just a little bit stiffer, okay, and it's a little bit easier on the rig, a little bit more abrasion resistant. And at the end of my rig is a 9-0 VMC inline tournament circle hook. Anybody here fishing circle hooks on a regular basis? Okay. Back in the day, they introduced these hooks called circle hooks. And everybody looked at them and said, what the hell is that thing? Okay, a hook is supposed to be like a J, right? The point's not supposed to come back in. Some of them even come back in and go down. And you go, man, how am I supposed to catch anything with that? I was one of those people. Okay, excuse me, I was like, I'm not tying that on. No way, I'm not doing it. And when nobody was looking, I'm tying a J hook right back on. And then I realized, you know, I'm making a mistake here. Circle hooks have been around for a very long time. This is what the commercial fishermen use on their long line sets, and they've proven their worth. I, I have to tell you, it's rare that you will even see a J hook on my boat any longer. It's all about the circle hooks. But there are some really important factors that you need to remember when you're fishing these circle hooks. Number one, you guys ever watch Bassmasters on Saturday after you watch my show? And then you see the guy get a bite, and he goes, Ooh, and he's just start, you know, swinging. And, oh, I got him, I got him. You know, Bill Dance or whatever. And you know, they're swinging like, oh, my God. And you're thinking they got this giant fish, and it's a bass this big. Okay? And they're driving that hook home. You can't do that with circle hooks. You can't. This hook will hook the fish itself. The fish picks up the bait. He swims off. He turns, and this hook stuck right in the corner of his mouth 99% of the time. Not every time. I say every time, but 99% of the time. Sometimes he will get them down in the gut if they really swallow that bait, but usually right in the corner of the mouth. It's a simple hook to fish, and it's deadly effective. And why is it so important in deep water? Remember, again, everything's about the details, okay? Deep water, you may not feel this guy eat that bait. Okay, remember that this guy, he's got this incredible sense of smell. And I'm referring to this mutton snapper, but the same applies to groupers, the same applies to tilefish, especially these trophy-sized mutton snapper that I really am a huge fan of, okay, because they're smart, smart fish. They come up to a bait. They swim up to it, and they smell it. Okay, they look at it. Okay, you think I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. They smell it. Okay, and all these sensory organs inside that fish are reacting to different things that are happening. And he's looking at it. And then he'll go, Foop! and in one swift motion, he will swallow that entire bait. Okay, and I'm not talking about nibbling. These fish do not nibble. Okay, they go, Foop! and just swallow the entire bait right in their mouth. So now he's eating that bait, and he's just sitting there. It's not moving. He's just sitting there, doop, 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 chewing on it. And I don't even feel it sometimes because you're so fast and it's 800 or it's 500 feet away or 400 feet away with muttons and he's just sitting on the bait. And then he turns around to swim off, boom, the hook gets him right in the corner of the mouth every time. These are not stupid fish, okay? They're not. And I'm telling you, if something doesn't look right, if it doesn't smell right, if it doesn't taste right or move right, they're not going to eat it. They're hungry, they're not, but they're not dumb. Okay, they're not. They didn't get big. You know the expression, right? You don't get big by being dumb when it comes to being a fish. So these circle hooks are really, really important. How do you connect that? You'll see I have a very small loop knot. Okay, I know you can't see from back there, but it's tied on with a very small loop knot. That allows that hook just a little bit more freedom. Okay, a little bit more freedom. Bait looks a little bit more natural. That's what I want. I want the most natural presentation. If I'm fishing on a boat with 20 guys, okay, I want my bait to look so real and to look so right, I strive for it. I'll sit there and I will like tailor this bait. People are looking at me like, dude, what are you doing? And I'm like, my bait's got to look right, okay, because these fish are not dumb. 
So everything has to be right. And all of these little details can make a very big difference. On this particular outfit, I may be fishing this certainly during the day. I could fish this outfit at night. Whenever I'm fishing two to 400 feet of water, up to 500 feet of water, if the conditions allow me to, okay? I've got a reel that has plenty of line capacity, super, super sensitive outfit, but yet super strong. How strong, I'm gonna tell you. On one of these long range trips, right at sunrise, we're fishing an area we dubbed Sunrise City, fishing for mutton snappers, catching them was really good. Then I get a crushing bite on this outfit right here. I come tight and I'm fishing way out there. We're about 115 miles out in the Gulf of Mexico, fishing about 350 feet of water. I come tight on a big fish and this thing is kicking my butt. And I mean kicking my butt. An hour later, I'm back at the back of the boat on my knees with the rod completely bent over at the rail, full drag, okay? And literally, it took me two hours, and I pulled up a 175-pound Goliath grouper. I was very disappointed because I was hoping it was a giant black or a Warsaw. And unfortunately, you know the law with Goliath grouper, we had to cut it off, and it floated away. And I was extremely disappointed that I killed this incredible fish that a shark is going to eat. Okay, I should have brought it home and given it to somebody, but that's a different seminar altogether. Fishing is one of those awesome pastimes and sports and activities where everybody does it differently. We all do the same thing, but everybody has their own little nuances. Everybody has their own little way of doing things. Do you know how many ways there are to rig a ballyhoo? Okay. <laughs> you know, you should rig a ballyhoo one way. There are thousands of ways to rig a ballyhoo. Doesn't mean any of them are wrong. There are thousands of ways to rig a bottom rig, okay? Doesn't mean any of them are wrong. I'm sharing with you my experiences, how I fine-tuned it, how I've watched, and I watch. Let me tell you something, I watch. I sit there and I pay attention to everything. And I'm like, why is this happening? Or why did that happen? Or why am I getting tangled? Or I'm not getting tangled because of. So I'm always thinking of the good and the bad, and I'm constantly fine-tuning and refining. And one of the things that we're going to start to talk about here real quick is the deep dropping with multiple hook rigs. And the truth of the matter is, if you asked me a year ago how I was deep dropping, I would tell you a completely different story than I'm going to tell you today. Not because that way was wrong. That way was right. I caught a lot of fish. This way is even better. His question was, can you use that rig off of South Florida? You can use that rig Korea, you know, whatever. I mean, anywhere that you would like to, and certainly if the conditions allow, that's a great rig to fish. So it's not specific to the location, it's specific to the target species, it's specific to the depth, to the current. You know, one thing that I mentioned to you is that 9-0 circle hook. That's the hook that I use when I am deep water bottom fishing. Out here in 800 feet looking for scorpion grouper that are this big, you know, the black belly rose fish, you guys know what I'm talking about? I'm using that 9-0 hook. If I'm 150 miles out in the Gulf looking for that guy, I'm using that 9-0 hook. If I'm out here fishing for blue line tiles, I'm using that 9-0 hook. If I'm fishing for mutton snapper at night up on the bank, anyone want to guess what hook I'm using? Okay, I'm using that hook. That's it. I'm not sitting there all day fumbling, oh, no, this is the wrong hook. Let me use this hook. Let me use that hook. I don't need to. I've caught it all on that hook, and that's the right hook. It's the right hook. I'm, I'm telling you, for me... And for everyone that I've turned on to that hook has just had a tremendous amount of success with that size and style hook. I use a VMC 9.0 inline tournament circle hook. It's inline. That means the hook is not bent. Okay, why? Because in the Gulf of Mexico, the law is you have to use an inline tournament or an inline circle hook whenever you're fishing natural bait. May it be a live bait or a cut bait. When you're in the Gulf of Mexico, you have to fish that inline non-stainless circle hook. Out here and in the Bahamas, you do not. Fish whatever you want to fish, okay? But in the Gulf, you have to fish the inline. Now let's talk about the deep stuff, okay? So you're out there, you're, you know, and this is daytime only. We do not deep drop. We do not fish the bottom in water over 400 feet at night. Never, absolutely never do we deep drop in over 400 feet at night. Anyone want to take a guess why? It's because the fish don't bite. They don't bite at night. The snappers and the groupers, down that deep, when it's pitch black, they don't bite. And you wonder, you say, well, wait a second. It's 800 feet deep. Even during the day, it's black. They know. 
They know. Don't ask me how they know, but they know. I'm telling you, they know. Okay? They know even when it's cloudy. We've been out there on days where it's overcast and cloudy and the bite sucks. Okay? And then suddenly the skies open up and it's beautiful and the bite just explodes. The fish were there the whole time. They, never, they didn't just get there. They lived there. They were there the whole time. Okay? The clearer it is, keep this in mind, the clearer it is, bluebird days are going to be the best deep water bottom fishing days. That's when they bite the best. And often in the morning when we're out there long range, we will start the day wahoo fishing, trolling for wahoo from usually 6 to 9 a.m. to give the sun a chance to raise higher in the sky and get brighter. Those fish know it. Okay, they really, really do. So what do we do at night? One of the things is we continue to fish up on the bank with the manual equipment. Okay? Same technique, same species. Okay? The snappers, red grouper, uh, mutton snapper, yellow eye snapper, ham bone snapper, uh, scamp grouper, all of that is still you can fish at night right on the bottom. However, there's another really cool activity that really goes off at night, and that is the blackfin tuna. Okay, blackfin tuna. This is really important because when you go on these long range trips, you know, we touched on earlier about preparation. I've been on these trips where I've seen guys pull up in a pickup truck with a trailer, and the whole truck was filled with gear and the trailer. And I'm going, where are they going? And I got four rods and a little orange box right here. And I'm going, what am I doing or what are they doing that I'm not doing? And we end up catching a lot more fish than they do. So you don't need all of this crazy gear that you're not going to use. Okay? And I, I bring this up because we're talking about blackfin tuna fishing. We're talking about jigging for blackfin tuna at night. You need to make sure that you're properly prepared not only with your deep drop rods, and your bottom fishing rods, but also with a rod that you can catch these blackfin tuna with at night. What happens at night? These party boats. This is, again, another benefit to these head boats. I go out on my boat. You go out on your boat. We've got a couple little floodlights. Yeah, it's cute. Okay? Eh. You go out on a head boat. They've got lights shining all around the boat. Creates this giant aura of light. I mean, literally, you can't, you know, you, you don't really appreciate how much light it's putting out. But when you're 100 miles off the beach, it's pitch black out there, right? Pitch black. Suddenly, you have one boat that's got 30 of these giant lights all shooting down into the water. What's going to happen? Bait. Bait. We'll sit there, and it, as soon as that sun goes over the horizon, first the squid. You see squid come all around the boat, live squid, really, really cool. Then the flying fish. Yeah, baby. That's what you want, those flyers, okay? Flying fish everywhere around the boat then ballyhoo, all sorts of life will swarm in these lights. And we'll catch this bait. We'll use a long net, you know, like a, literally a 25-foot long net, and just scoop them, scoop them up. The flying fish and the squid, then we take the flying fish, we cut the wings off, stick it, you know, stick it on that 9-0 hook, drop it down right away every time. They just love them. Why a fish that lives 400 feet down loves flying fish that live way up there no idea. I can only imagine because it's alive, it's squirming around, it's a great bait, and he's going to eat it. So getting back to the tuna gig. So at night, you can fish the bottom, but now you have all of this bait that's developing all around the boat, and you have a natural chum slick because you've got 20 guys that are dropping their rigs to the bottom, bringing them back up, dropping the bait to the bottom. So picture 20 guys doing that for hours, what's happening around the boat you're creating this natural chump slick, right? And this natural odor that all game fish are attracted to, especially pelagic game fish. And right in the middle of that, you've got this giant boat with all these lights in the water, with all this live bait around it. Any tuna within a country mile is gonna be there, okay? At one point in the night, those blackfin tuna are gonna show up. When that happens, I don't need that really eight foot, heavier rod. I don't need that because I'm not fishing the bottom. Where are tuna? Right up on top. They're in the top third of the water column. You can catch them in the bottom and make no mistake, there are plenty of deep water bottom trips where you will take that rig, you will drop a squid or any type of bait to the bottom or a jig in up to 800 feet of water. And right on the bottom in 800 feet of water, you catch 30 pound blackfin tuna. Who would have thought? You'd be like, why am I catching 30-pound tuna right on the bottom in 800 feet? I don't care. They're there. I'm going to catch them. Okay? 
but usually they're in the top of the water column because they're feeding on all of those squid, they're feeding on all of those flying fish. So in between fishing the bottom, I can whip out my jigging rod, really, really light, great little chaos jigging rod rated for up to 300 grams, little Daiwa Isla size 5,000 reel, 30 pound braid on the reel, same thing, different color, but exact same line, 30 pound diamond braid, and again, I've got a 50 pound, or actually in this particular case, a 40 pound diamond presentation fluorocarbon leader tied to a jig, a little Williamson 100 gram jig. Glows in the dark, this is a high speed vertical jig. Remember what this jig is designed to do, and this is important because we're gonna talk about deep water bottom fishing, or I should say deep water jigging in a second, and that's a different ball game altogether. When I'm targeting these tuna, I want a bait that's darting through the water, like this. Doo, doo, doo. So I drop this jig down 200 feet, lock it up. You guys know high speed vertical jigging, and I'm whipping this jig right back up toward the boat. Gets blasted by blackfin tuna. A lot of fun, a lot of fun on this rod. Great change of pace from you know using a heavier outfit for the bottom fish. Really, really fun and exciting, and you can just wreck the blackfin tunas at night. And the more guys that are doing it, on the boat, the more exciting it is because it's more action, more activity, and more jigs racing through the water. As far as the color of the jig, as long as it has glow. I don't care what it has, as long as there's glow on there. Glow in silver, glow in black, glow in glow, glow in whatever you want. As long as it has glow. You'll notice that there are no connection points, no swivels, no barrel swivels, no anything. I've got my top shot tied right to my braid, and from there I go right to my jig. There's nothing that could fail, nothing that could go wrong. As long as my drag is set properly, I can have a great time all night long catching 15 to 30 pound blackfin tuna. Doesn't happen every night on every long range trip, but certainly it happens on a lot of them and enough of them to make sure that you better be prepared with a jigging rod, with a high speed vertical jigging rod. Now it's the morning and the sun is coming up. We may troll for Wahoo or now we may transition and go fish some deep water. 500, 600, 800 feet of water, depending on the conditions. Remember that out there in the deep, the fish are there. The fish are always there, okay? They're not coming and going. They're not migrating, okay? They're there. The problem is not finding fish. The problem is finding fish that will bite, okay? That will bite. This was just proven to me again on a recent trip, not even a month ago. I'm up in the wheelhouse with the captain of this head boat. We're moving from one spot to the next, and we go over a pile. When I say a pile, my eyes just went, Woof. I'm like, Greg, stop right here. Okay, I mean, a pile of fish. I couldn't believe it. So he's not as excited as I am. And I'm like, I'm trying, not, you know, trying to contain my excitement. I'm not saying anything, and I'm like, we're going to wreck them. I go down on deck. I say to my brother, I'm like, dude, get ready. I say to my buddies, get ready. We all drop down. We catch nothing, okay, <laughs> nothing, literally. And I'm like looking up at him, and he looks at me, you know, from up on the upper bridge. He goes, I told you, because he had just got done telling me that finding fish is not the problem. Finding fish that want to bite is the problem. The conditions have to be right. The drift has to be right. There's so many different factors that have to come together for these brilliant fish that are down there to really want to bite. Earlier, you know, when we started the seminar, we were talking about this big bulky equipment and these big heavy duty electric reels. That's old stuff. We're not fishing with that any longer. Now it's all about this handheld light power assist equipment. This is called the Daiwa Mega Twin. You may be more familiar with the Daiwa Tanacom. This reel you can see has a little plug and it plugs into a battery, 12 volt car battery. So when you go on these long range trips, some of the boats provide the batteries for you, like the Gulf Star. Some boats you have to bring your own batteries, okay? And you bring one fully charged battery, you plug your reel into it, the battery is right there by your feet, and you now have all of the power that you need, all of the electricity for the entire trip. A full, fully charged 12 volt battery will operate this reel for no less than 48 hours straight. This rod is exactly the same as that rod. Not close, exactly. Why? Because I had them built too. Why? Because I'm really familiar with the action of this rod. 
So I want the action of this rod to be the same. I don't want to go to two completely different outfits because now I have to retrain my fingers, the sensitivity and the feeling. So I'm really comfortable with this outfit and I'm really comfortable with this outfit. The only difference is this reel gives me the ability to push this little lever forward. And that little lever brings up this two pound lead <laughs> really fast from 800 feet of water. It's not so bad reeling a fish up, am I right? But if you don't have a fish and you're just trying to check your bait, I gotta tell you, one or two times is not a big deal. Do it for 12 hours straight, okay? 12 hours straight cranking two, three, four pounds of lead up from 800 feet, forget that. The Daiwa Tanacoms have really proven their worth. Looks like, you know, this little plastic thing, but I'm telling you what, super strong. But remember that it also has a handle, so you can crank manually if you so chose. Also remember that if you do crank manually, the gear ratio is like one to one, so it'll take you about an hour to reel this up from the bottom, so I don't recommend it. It also has a drag, an adjustable drag. Companies spend bazillions of dollars creating these adjustable drags to be adjusted. Even though this is a power assist reel, you have to use it like a regular reel. You're constantly ad adjusting the drag. It's not as simple as just drop that rig to the bottom, you get a bite, pop it in gear, and hold a rod, okay, and wind the fish up. It doesn't work that way. If you do that, which I can tell you so many times I've watched guys do this, they'll drop the rig to the bottom, they'll hold the rod under their arm, they'll get a bite, they'll go into full speed, and they'll stand there, and the rod will go, pop, and they'll break the fish off. Why? Okay, let me explain. Big, powerful fish like this. Powerful. This is not a little weakling, okay? And we're talking about big snowy groupers, yellow edge groupers, trophy size, blue line tile fish, queen snapper. These fish are strong. They really are. I mean, you're talking about a 20, 30, 40 pound fish. They're strong, okay? If you try and slam the brakes on a 30 pound grouper, the second that it eats a bait, what's going to happen? You're going to lose them. No matter what, something is going to go wrong. You're going to pull a hook out of them. The rig is going to break. A knot is going to break. Your leader is going to break. Something is going to break. And you are going to lose that fish 100% of the time. This is about finesse. Deep water bottom fishing is about finesse. If you leave here tonight and you only remember one thing, finesse. So when you're deep water fishing, 400 to 800, sometimes even 1,000 feet if the conditions allow you to fish 1,000 feet, if there's not a lot of current, the rig is now different. We're now fishing a deep drop rig. If you'll do me a favor, sir, just hold that. Now, deep drop rigs come in a lot of different styles, a lot of different shapes and styles. Will you do me a favor and hold that tip real high for me there? So you will notice that this is a high-low rig, a two-hook rig. I've got one hook way over there. I've got my second hook right here close to my sinker. But you will notice that these hooks cannot touch. Notice that uh, this only comes to here, that only comes to there. So I know that the two hooks cannot tangle with each other, right? Okay, really important. My sinker is right on the bottom. I'm fishing 90% of the time, two pounds of lead. Two pounds. If there's a lot of current and I have to go to three pounds, I don't like it. If I can't even hold the bottom with three pounds, we're not catching anything because we're drifting way too fast. Your line is scoping way out. Your rig is coming up off the bottom. Your baits are not in the strike zone, and you're not going to be successful. Ideal conditions way offshore in this deep water allow you to fish two pounds of lead. My bottom one is close, as you can see, because tile fish. Tile fish, remember what we said, live where? In the mud. The mud right on the bottom. However, the groupers will come way off the bottom. They'll come at least 10 feet or about 10 feet off the bottom. So you will notice that your top hook catches the majority of the grouper and your bottom hook catches the majority of the tile fish. Back in the day, I used to tie these rigs with three hooks and I used to use those little sleeve swivels. I'm not sure if you guys know what those are. They slide right down on the line, okay? Nah, no more. That's not the best way to do it. I've evolved into a two-hook rig. Why? Because very, very rarely are you going to be catching three fish at one time. You certainly can catch two at one time. That happens very often, especially when the bite's really on fire. 
I don't want to bring up more than two because I've got a 10-pound grouper on this one. I've got a 15-pound who knows what on this one. And they're both going in two different ways. They're not looking at each other going, okay, let's be nice to Mike and both swim up together. Okay, they're not. They're both swimming in two different ways. And if I had a third fish on there, sometimes they'll bust your rig right off. And you'll literally lose your entire rig because you've got just too much going on. You don't need a three-hook rig. If you're in the Bahamas, there's no current, and you want to fish for yellow eyes or snapper, I also have the exact same rig in a four-hook version. Okay, But for the most part, a two-hook rig is ideal. It's all that you need. Okay, There's a couple of really important factors about this rig, these three-way swivels. This is just an improved clinch knot. It's a fisherman's knot. It's an easy knot to tie. Who knows how to tie an improved clinch knot? Almost everybody, okay? Very easy. If you don't know how, go home tonight and learn, okay? And it's very reliable, really reliable. So it's easy to tie, it's quick, and it's cheap. Those sleeve swivels are really expensive, you know, and you could start to spend 10 to $15 per rig. Here, a couple bucks, a couple of three-way swivels, a couple hooks, really easy peasy. But there's a couple of important factors about this. Swivel on the sinker. See that swivel right there on the sinker? Why? Because I know that this sinker spins like that on the way down and on the way up. How do we know? Because we've put cameras right on our line at times, and we've watched. And we saw, and I went, holy moly, I never knew that sinker did that. Okay? And literally, it'll spin. So we want that swivel on there to avoid the rig getting tangled because the more times our rig is tangled, the less fish that we're catching. It's all about the details. Okay, so swivel on the bottom, swivel on the top, three-way swivels. Another really important factor with these three-way swivels versus those swivel sleeves that we were talking about, let's say this gets chafed or I lose the hook or this part breaks. One of a million things can happen. I don't have to retie an entire rig. All I got to do is just take a little piece of monofilament, tie a hook on, boom, I'm back in business, right? Okay, so I'm saving money, I'm saving time, and I'm maximizing the time that I'm keeping baits in the strike zone. And that's what it's all about. Because when I go out on these trips, I want to be one thing, high hook. That's what I want to be, high hook. I'm committed to catching as much as I possibly can. Do I always? No. You know, but I certainly try. The light. Do you need a light when you're offshore deep water bottom fishing? And here's my philosophy with that. And keep in mind, that little plastic thing up there, like I said, is a light, and it's water activated. So as soon as it's submerged, it'll start to strobe and flash, okay? And it will flash for days, you know, days on end. It's a, what I found with the lights is if you're fishing by yourself out here, deep dropping, or even in the Bahamas, and there's only two guys on the boat, lights are really, really important, really important, because they're attracting attention to your rig. However, if you're deep dropping on a boat with 20 guys and they all have two and three hook rigs and they're all dropping down, you don't need anything to attract attention. You've got 50 baits in the water in this natural chunk slick. So it can be a benefit, but it is not absolutely essential. However, if you are going to fish a light, make sure it's one of these small little strobes, this little Dura light, or there's Diamond Light from LP. There's different companies that make them. Uh, there's different colors. This one happens to be green. If somebody said to me what your favorite color is, I would say green simply because that's a natural color out in the ocean, okay, is that green. Red, white, blue, they even make these in what we call disco, where it's just a variety of different lights flashing, okay. They all work to some extent, but it's not absolutely essential. Perfect outfit. It's under your arm. It's not being fished out of a rod holder. You're fishing just like this all day, just like you would do with a manual rod. But now I can fish up to a thousand feet of water. This, however, is loaded not with 30 pound braid, but 50 pound braid. Why am I stepping it up? Because I'm fishing more lead. Now, remember on my manual outfit, I was fishing 10, 12, 16 ounces at the most. On my deep drop outfit, I might fish four pounds if there's a lot of current. So I want that little bit of beefier line. Plus, I'm fishing two hooks, okay? On my other outfit, I'm fishing one hook. So I know I'm only going to be catching one fish at a time. On here, there's the potential to hook two of those at one time. 
So I want that extra little security. The top shot, same thing. Same thing as before. We need that monofilament top shot on top of our braid for the elasticity. I'm bringing up that fish. The boat's going up and down. I may have two fish on here pulling in different directions. You need that little shock absorbing factor. You have to have it. You don't need a lot. 25 feet, 80 or 100 pound. So remember, 30 pound braid, we put a 50 or 60 pound top shot. 50 pound braid, we'll put an 80 or 100 pound top shot. Same rod, reel plugs in, boom, you're good to go. His question is, are you fishing that two pound sinker here or are you talking about way out in the Gulf? Both, certainly way out in the Gulf. Here I can fish two pounds with this outfit to about, sometimes if I'm lucky and there's not a lot of current, 700 feet. Beyond that, no way in the world, no chance. Sometimes out to 700 feet, if there's only maybe two and a half to three knots of current, you can get to the bottom. There's so many black belly rose fish out here that you're going to get bit immediately as soon as you get to the bottom. But once you get out to that 900, 1100, and you really start getting into that deeper water, you're going to need four, five pounds. Usually five pounds is what I'll fish out in that depth. Way out in the Gulf, a lot less current, two pounds is the way to go. Absolutely perfect. His question is, have you ever used a light in two to 400 feet of water? Certainly out here, we fish for gray tile fish a lot in 420 foot, give or take. Oh, let me say that again, 420 foot. You might want to write that down, okay? And we use a light. I will tell you, we did drop a camera right out here in 420 feet of water, a GoPro in a specialized housing with a tile fish rig and dropped it down 420 feet right to the bottom and the footage that we acquired that we got was amazing. Okay, we were watching these gray tile fish which were like rats. They were coming in from everywhere and chasing these baits and the squid, but they wouldn't come more than two feet off the bottom. They wouldn't touch the hook that was anywhere near that light. Did the light attract them? I don't know in that particular case because the housing that we sent down had a very bright light in it because it's very deep, okay? but. Absolutely, to answer your question, yes, we will fish a light out here. Even on a head boat, sometimes we'll fish it, but it's not as mandatory. The best line that I have found, Mamoy makes an extra hard leader material. It's literally called extra hard. And it's a little bit stiffer. I really like that because your branches are a little bit stiffer when they come off your rig. And you know, let me mention this real quick. Everybody has seen those deep drop rigs, you know, the multiple hook ones. These, you know, like I said, this is just a plain four hook one. But there's some that have like all of these contraptions on them. They got glow beads and glow squids and all of this hardware on this rig. Listen, that's not what's attracting the fish down there. It's the bait that's on the hook. You want a clean, streamlined presentation. You want an efficient, clean presentation. I'm one of those people where I make all my own rigs. I stay away from all of that junk. If I don't need it on the hook, it's not going on. In either scenario, if I'm deep dropping or if I'm fishing with the single hook rig, bait is super important. We all know that. Squid, the number one bait for bottom fishing. You know, so many guys go on these long range trips and they bring these big coolers filled with all of this crazy bait. They spend like a week just bait fishing. And they bring a whole variety of different stuff. I bring frozen boxes of squid. Everything eats them. You fish a whole squid. But more importantly than everything eats them is that it's streamlined. It's streamlined. And I can't stress how important that is. When you're dropping a bait down to 400, 600, 800 feet, the last thing you want is that bait to go like this in the water and to spin. Okay, your rig is going to get tangled. The leader is going to get tangled. You need a bait that is streamlined. And those whole squid are perfect for that. Another bait that's really good is a strip of a fish. Bonita, jacks, kingfish, barracuda, anything that you can catch out there that's fresh, we cut it up and we make strips. I don't mean a strip like, I don't want you to picture a bonita strip that's really thin. I mean a steak, okay, a big strip that has a lot of meat on it, but it's streamlined. And that is super, super important to avoid getting tangled and to catch fish. Lately, this year, for a number of different reasons, which I'm not gonna get into right now, but squid has been really hard to come by. Medium-sized squid. You could either get these little things that are about that big, or these big swordfish squid. 
Okay, so what I do is I buy the big swordfish squid and I rip the head off. And now what I have in my hand is just the head of that squid with all of the tentacles and it looks like an octopus. Okay, literally looks like an octopus and they love it. They absolutely love it. How do I know that? Because we've caught so many grouper and snapper that have octopuses right in their throats. Okay, so these fish will eat almost anything as long as it looks good, smells good, moves the right way. It's got to be right. It's got to be streamlined. Everything has to be right. Jigging, okay, really, really becoming super popular offshore. This is an absolutely favorite tactic of mine. We talked about the vertical jigs, right, for the blackfin tuna up in the top of the water column. We talked about that. Deep water jigging is a different ball game altogether. I am not going to take a vertical jig like this and drop it drop it to the bottom 400 feet down. The jig isn't even going to make it to the bottom. That's not what it was designed for. That jig is designed to move through the water like this, to be worked fast, vertically, in the upper echelons of the water column. However, we're targeting bottom fish, snapper, grouper, tile fish, a variety of species of each that all relate to the structure right on the bottom, right? So where do we want to keep our jig? On the bottom. So now all of these jig companies realize this and they're creating all of these new fancy flat fall jigs that allow you instead of working that high speed vertical jig, they allow you to drop a jig to the bottom and do this. I am one of those people where I would rather catch one of those on a jig than five on bait because it's just that, sat that satisfaction that I fooled this incredible predator, this brilliant fish, I fooled it into believing my piece of metal was worth him eating. That's satisfaction to me because anyone can catch him on bait. Not everybody can catch him good on the jig. That's what we call it. If you asked me three years ago, could you catch golden tile fish, mutton snapper, big red groupers on jigs on the bottom? I'd be like, yeah, with a bucktail jig with a piece of bait on it. Remember, you know, that's an old standing technique. But with these new jigs, they're accomplishing feats that we never thought were possible. There's a whole bunch of jigs out there on the market from a variety of manufacturers. Some of the most popular ones that we handed out here, Shimano, Williamson, they make these jigs that are specifically designed to fish right on the bottom, either like flat fall jigs that you can lift and let the jig flutter back down, lift, let the jig flutter back down, lift. And that jig, instead of it moving this way, it moves horizontally or it'll sweep or it'll spiral. It's designed to be fished right on the bottom or in a specific level of the water column. Now, all of those jigs are super effective. They're also super expensive, okay? They're not cheap. It's worth paying for them because they work. But I have found the most productive jig, I hope you don't kill me here, Marshall, for telling people this, is a basic everyday hammered diamond jig. Right here, costs about six bucks. Sometimes you buy them on the internet from overseas for about $1.85. This is the most effective deep water bottom fishing jig that I have ever used in my entire life or that I've ever seen used in my entire life. I will take this basic hammer diamond jig over any one of those fancy Shimano Shimano whatever blah 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 okay any day of the week any day of the week. It's not about what it looks like it's about what that jig does and there's a couple of really important factors with this jig. Number one it's heavy 10 ounces. 10 ounces, it's heavy. Why is that important? Where do I want my jig? Right on the bottom. I don't want my jig to sweep up off the bottom because that's not where the groupers and snappers are gonna eat it, okay? They're gonna eat it right off the bottom. So I need a heavy jig. I need a jig that's easy to fish. I don't wanna sit there and go crazy. These hammer jigs are incredibly effective and incredibly easy. All you have to do is drop it to the bottom, lift your rod, and drop it back down. Lift your rod and drop it back down. Lift your rod and drop it back. It's that easy. Anybody can do it, which is another reason that this is such an effective jig. It catches everything. Blackfin tunas, groupers, snappers, tilefish, everything eats this. Why? Because when it flutters back to the bottom, what does it look like? A wounded baitfish or a wounded squid. I don't care what they think it looks like because as long as they eat it, right? But that's what it looks like, just fluttering back down. 
and they crush it. And you'll notice that I have two hooks. I have a hook on the front and a hook on the back, or a hook on the back and a hook on the front. I don't care how you look at it. Because sometimes they come at it from the side, sometimes they'll just sweep in at it. So we have found that we get a much better hookup ratio when we have a hook at both ends of the jig. Really simple. You can see at one time this was bright gold. It has caught so many fish, it's literally just beat up. But a great, great jig, cheap. Don't think that you need one of these super $25 you know, jigs in order to catch fish on the bottom. What's more important is how you're fishing it and the equipment that you're using. Now you'll notice here, same reel. Same reel that I was using on my, on my bait rod, right? Same exact reel. So I'm accustomed to this reel. I know how it works. I know the drag. I know the reel inside and out. I feel very, very fortunate and humbled that I'm able to have a handful of quality reels that are consistent. So I'm not picking up these different outfits each time and going, Oh, what is that? How does this? What does this feel like? You know what I'm saying? And having to readjust. I know my equipment and I know it really well. 30 pound braid, 60 pound top shot on top of the braid, tied directly to the jig. Just like my other jigging outfit, there are no weak points. There's nothing that can break. The rod, little bit of a trick here. The rod is almost the same rod as this eight foot rod, but it's a little bit shorter. Okay, it's one foot shorter. It's a seven foot rod. Okay, very, very similar, but a seven foot rod. Why? Because when I take this jig and I drop it to the bottom 500 feet down, and if I use that eight foot rod that has just a little bit of a faster taper, a little bit of a softer tip, as I'm jigging that jig, that tip of that rod is absorbing a lot of the movement of the jig. You guys kind of picking up what I'm throwing down here? So instead, I have a rod that's a little bit shorter, same rod, but a little bit stiffer on the end. So now when I jig that jig, every inch of movement is translated all the way down the line, all the way to the jig. Small differences make a big difference out there. I've stood there and been jigging right next to guys and they're using these ugly sticks or these you know flimsy little rods and jigging and the rod's going wah, wah, and I'm like, dude, your jig isn't even moving. Y your jig is just sitting on the bottom. It's not even moving. Okay, and you're not catching, you know, no wonder you're not catching anything. So, again, it's having specialized tackle that's suited specifically for the task, and how small difference can make a huge difference. A huge difference. So, same rod, just a little bit shorter. You can fish these jigs in any depth that will allow you to fish them. Okay, 200 feet, 400 feet. 600 feet, we've even jigged in 800 feet. And you may be thinking, 800 feet, that's crazy. How could you drop a 10 ounce jig to in 800 feet of water and not kill yourself, your arm, or actually catch fish? I promise you, it works. If the conditions allow it, and there's not a lot of current, drop the jig down because of the 30 pound braid. Remember that the sensitivity that it offers, it's really, really thin, not a lot of resistance in the water column. I can get that jig all the way to the bottom. Every sweep of the rod, that jig is going to move. Excellent question. Do you find them hitting the jig on the way up or on the way down? They'll do both. Yeah, these are J hooks because when you're jigging, this is not like you're fishing bait with a circle hook. Different scenario. Different feeding activity. These fish are crushing the jig. They come up to it and they hit it. And it's really cool because they'll miss it sometimes. You'll be jigging, you'll feel whack, and you're like, oh, and then you, doo, 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 and I'll hit it again. You know, so it's super exciting. But in this scenario, it's about the J-hooks. It's not about the circle hooks. Weight, super important. You obviously need a jig that is heavy enough to stay in the strike zone or you're not going to catch anything. And keep in mind that these jigs not, not only catch bottom fish. On a recent trip, one of my neighbors right from here in Lighthouse Point, fishing a Flat fall Shimano jig. Dropped it to the bottom, 300 feet of water, jigging, didn't catch anything, reeling it back up 20 feet away from the boat, a 70 pound Wahoo ate it. Okay, 20 feet away from the boat. He's a screaming line. I'm like, oh, dude, you're done because he's fishing straight mono. You know, no wire, he's fishing a jig. I'm like, you're done. 20 minutes later, we sunk the gaff into it, 70 pounds. Okay, and I'm like, wow, you know, that'll never happen again. He's like, that's my first Wahoo. I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, so his very first while whoever is a 70 pounder on a jig on mono. I'm like, Joey, 
Never going to happen again, dude. Never, ever going to happen again. I've narrowed down my arsenal to where I could fish daytime, nighttime, up on the bank, two to 300 feet, 400 feet, 500 feet, all the way to 1,000 feet of water, okay, with these four rods. I don't need 30 rods. I need four. Could I do it with less than four rods? Absolutely. If I want to sit there and take that reel off of that rod and this reel off and exchange reels, I could do it. The only other rod that I'm going to bring, which I highly recommend you do as well, is a, is a trolling outfit for Wahoo because there's a lot of Wahoo out there. Deep water, a lot of current, you know, both out here in the Gulf Stream, way out in the Gulf. There's a tremendous amount of Wahoo out there. Why is there so many Wahoo out in the Gulf? A lot of bait, the blackfin tuna, the blackfin tuna. That's what they're eating. They love blackfin tuna, okay? So there's so many blackfin tuna out there. There's a lot of wahoo out there. It makes sense. So if I want to catch a wahoo, I'm going to fish a lure that looks like blackfin tuna. Very, very simple. This is all you need. This is called a Yozuri Bonita, okay? A Yozuri Bonita. It's rigged on wire, heavy rod, because remember, Big fish, okay, and I'm not fooling around. I'm not going out there to fish for Wahoo with a little 20-pound kite outfit. Different scenario. You're trolling off of a private boat, charter boat, or off of a head boat. When you're moving from point A to point B or in the morning, early in the morning, we tro we're trolling. I don't need a really complicated leader system with a, you know, inline cigar weight like the way we fish in the Bahamas for Wahoo because we're not high-speed trolling. The boat's not moving at 16 knots, 10 knots. Ten knots. That's the speed of a typical party boat. I want you to keep that in mind because sometimes when we're fishing 120 miles offshore, guess what the boat ride is? Somebody do the math. Twelve hours of sitting there going, are you kidding me, dude? Twelve hours to get out there. That's why we leave at 8 o'clock at night. So we steam all night long and you can sleep and you get there at 8 o'clock in the morning. It's a 12-hour boat ride. And that's why you fish the entire time. Because guess what? I know I have 12 hours to sleep on the way home. So I'll sleep on the way home. I'm going to stay out there at the rail, and I'm going to fish until I'm delirious, okay? until I have to sleep for an hour or two. So this is 80-pound mono is the high vis. Then there's a wind-on leader, a 25-foot, 200-pound test wind-on leader. And that goes to about, I don't know, I'd say four feet of 250-pound multi-strand cable. Wahoo have big teeth, they charge a bait very fast, so you absolutely need cable to prevent getting cut off. So I, over the years, when I started going long range, deep water bottom fishing, I was one of those guys where I had the pickup truck and the trailer with all of the stuff. And I realized, what am I doing? I really don't need all of this. I really need to narrow it down and make it efficient, make it simple and make it effective. You know, I know what I need. I know what I'm going to use. I'm not going out there to go yellowtail fishing. You're not going to catch yellowtail out there. You're 100 miles off the beach. You're not yellowtail fishing. I'm not going out there to go kite fishing. I don't have to bring all of this crazy stuff that I'm never going to use, okay? But I know what I'm going to use. Remember, too, anything that you need, you better bring. Because if you don't have it, you're not getting it out there. I'll tell you that right now. You're not getting it out there if you don't have it. So you better bring everything that you need and a backup for anything that you could need. So real quick here, what I do is I bring this one orange box. And within this one orange box, you'd be surprised what I have in here. There's a tray up on top. Real quick here, hand towels. You're going to need hand towels. Snips, extra pliers. Okay, I've got some split ring pliers for my jigs so I can add or take hooks on and off if I need to. I've got a multi-tool. Okay, I've got some, just in case this never ever happens to a chaos rod, but in case you break a guide, like a tip, a little glue stick to put one back on. Okay, so you never know when you may need that. Um, some oil, some lube, really important because you never want to be that guy who has the squeaky reel. Okay, <laughs> you don't want to be the guy who has the squeaky reel. Trust me when I tell you. I ripped that guy the whole trip, okay? Then the, we're going to talk more about the hooks, but the VMC 9.0 inline tournament circle hooks, those are for you. I know you're going to put them to good use. Bait knife, you're absolutely going to need that, right? You need a bait knife. I'm not giving that away. So <laughs> you absolutely need a bait knife. Leader material, 
okay? I know what I'm going to use. I'm not out there fishing 15-pound, 20-pound leader material. Not for fish like this. Come on, give me a break, okay? So really, 40, 60, 80, all you need. 40, 60, 80. Pocket spools right here ready to go, okay? So I've got those in my box and extra reel. Never know. Your reel could take a crap. I don't want to be out there 100 miles off the beach and the handle on my reel breaks. And don't tell me it can't happen because it can happen. And I end up not being able to fish properly. So an extra reel is certainly really important. Okay. Extra power cord. Remember what I said. These power cords are going to be plugged into a battery, plugs into the back of your electric reel. This power cord, this plug right here will fail. It's not if it will fail, it's when it will fail. Because for whatever reason, whoever invented that reel, okay, decided to put the plug on the bottom of the reel. Not thinking that, wait a minute, that power cord has to go in on a 90 degree angle, the way it's being fished, and this little, whatever you want to call it, okay, this plug is going to fail. It's not if, it will happen. And if you're out there deep dropping and your power cord takes a dump, and no one else has an extra power cord, guess what you're doing? Manual cranking, okay, <laughs> or not fishing. So an extra power cord. Extra electric reel. Never know, could happen. The electric reel could take a dump and not work, so I always have an, an extra electric reel as well. I'm ready, okay? I mean business when I go out, okay? Extra line, 50-pound diamond braid. This is all still coming out of this box. You see that, right? So diamond braid, if I need, you know, extra line on my reels, I got it right here. Magic box right here. In this box, I've got, I'm not going to open this up, everything will go all over the place, but I've got hooks, three-way swivels, beads, barrel swivels, everything I need to tie my rigs right, is right in this little box. So between my leader material, boom, I grab some leader, I grab my box, I got a pair of snips, I'm done. Okay, and that's another reason I'm not crimping and using crimps to tie my knots, okay, because now I need more crimps, I need a crimping tool, I'm keeping it simple. A simple overhand knot, I mean, I'm sorry, a simple fisherman's knot, and it's quick and it's easy. Everything I need is right here. I take out what I need. If I'm fishing bait and I'm fishing my, you know, my deep drop rod or my single manual rod, I keep this right on the bench right next to me, right on the tackle station, wherever it is, and everything I need is right here, okay? What I'm not going to pull out of here is there's a ton of sinkers, okay? Two ounces, four ounces, 16 ounces, egg sinkers, there's a ton of lead, jigs, plenty of vertical jigs, okay, all in there. So you can see everything that I could possibly need for a four-day deep drop trip, for fishing around the clock, daytime and nighttime fishing is in this one box right here. And the best part is it's weatherproof. It has a seal right there, closes, because throughout the trip you're going to get wet. There are going to be hoses on the boat, wash down on the boat. Stuff's going to get wet. I don't want all my stuff to get ruined, okay? So weatherproof is really simple. Oh, yeah, wait, I forgot. Extra wahoo lure, okay? <laughs> Never know when you may need that, okay? Extra wahoo lure. So other than your toiletries and all of that stuff, all my tackles condensed into one orange box. Four rods, maybe five if I bring that wahoo rod, okay? One orange box, and I'm kicking butt. I'm taking names. I'm kicking butt. The coolers, okay, real quick here, a couple things we'll touch on. Most of these boats, especially the head boats, you're not responsible for your own fish. What I mean by that, you catch a fish, they give you a tag, the fish is tagged, they then put that fish on ice in a cooler, all of the fish go together, you get back to the dock, they pull all of those fish out, everybody lines up, and they start calling your number. If you're lucky number 13, every time they call 13, guess what you're going to say? Here! and they're going to give you your fish, okay? As far as limits are concerned, you're allowed two daily limits on overnight trips, okay? Now, depending on if you're fishing in the Gulf, if you're fishing in the Atlantic, the laws change. Different times of the year, the laws change based on groupers. We know that. There's open season, closed season. But what I will tell you is the limits are much more flexible out in the Gulf. Why? I'll give you an example. Snowy grouper and yellow edge grouper are not counted in your grouper aggregate, and you can kill as many of them as you can catch, okay? Because you can't return them. There's no size limit. They all bug out. Their eyes are all bugged out, and you can keep as many as you want. Blue line tile fish, as many as you want, okay? Plus, you're allowed two daily limits of snappers. How many snappers is that? 20, okay? 20 snapper like that, I'm a happy guy, 
And that's just the snapper. Then you got the groupers and the tile fish and barrel fish and all this other crazy stuff on top of it. And then you have a cooler full of big black fin tuna. So often you're, you literally have too much fish, you know? Doesn't happen all of the time, but certainly happens enough of the time. So a couple things I'm gonna leave you with real quick. One, the finesse, remember that. I don't care if it's deep water, I don't care if it's big fish. If you wanna be successful, slow it down. Finesse, let the fish fight, let the fish run. Use your equipment properly, use that adjustable drag. Have confidence in your connections, okay? I know my knots are good. My hook isn't gonna break. My knot's not gonna break as long as I don't make a mistake, okay? As long as I don't make a mistake, chances are I'm gonna catch that fish, no matter how big it is. Certainly a lot could happen. He could spit the hook. You know, one of a million things, we all know a million different things can happen. I've gone on these trips and they have been terrible. Conditions were horrific. It was cloudy, rainy, too much current, whatever, and we caught, you know, nothing worth even talking about. I got off that boat, man, I was happy. I had a great time. Why did I have a great time? Number one, first and foremost, my cell phone didn't work. Okay, that's number one. Number two, the camaraderie that you build with these other anglers. These are guys that are there for the same reason that you are. And it's really enjoyable getting to know these people that are from all different walks of life and there for different reasons and families and friends and you really make some super super good friends and then you see these guys again and you get to know them and you look forward to fishing with them you're joking around a lot so the camaraderie is really really awesome then when you do have a good catch and you do put a good catch together that's really great to come home with two or three full coolers of these awesome fish that are super to eat you're talking about the best fish in the world here, people. The you know, one thing I will guarantee you, on any long-range, deep-water, bottom-fishing trip, you will catch the biggest of something that you've ever caught in your entire life, whatever that is. You may catch the biggest golden tilefish, the biggest queen snapper, the biggest snowy grouper, the biggest Warsaw grouper. You will catch the biggest of something that you've ever caught. And that one fish alone will make it all worthwhile.